so now we'd like to open it up and we actually do have about 15 minutes left. We'd really love to hear comments and questions. There are actually some students here who are in Jim's trip. If you could just raise your hands and introduce yourselves. Um, and feel free to ask them for their personal experiences having been on the trip. And just be sure that um, when you do make your comments that you speak into one of the microphones. So we'll open it up for conversation now. Um, the two of you, yes, and then it would love to hear questions. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And could you pass the mic? I was on the trip to China, and uh, as Jim said, that it was uh, an interesting process in trying to, um, I think for me, I was always concerned about how we were going to be graded, and I think when he said that, I was smiling, but I just wanted to, because there was so much, so much, so many things you could do while there, so it was important to just to uh, get a framework. And so I think the, when I look back on the trip, I think one of the assignments that I think some of us thought may have been tedious, but we had to do reflection. So each time we left a city, we had to write a reflection on what we learned and how that integrated into teaching and learning. And so it was something that um, as I'm preparing for my final presentation, I'm going back looking at those documents now and say, okay, that's what I was thinking, but now I'm gonna change that. But uh, uh, as I, I direct my final project, um, I think that if we, um, in the future, if we do this project again, that we try to um, maybe extend it and do it after the school year, and because I think there are so many other things that we could have done there, um, one of which is try to really go into the rural parts of the country and see how education is embarked there. And so I'll pass to Leslie. Um, my name is Leslie Bohan. I'm a higher ed um, doctoral student as well, and there are three of us here that were on the trip, and um, I think we just wanted to introduce ourselves, but um, certainly I, I, I really do feel like um, advocating, and it's very important to advocate for graduate study abroad. Um, we're in a, as adult learners. It is um, so crucial to have this hands-on experience and to bring, be able to bring in that international perspective to our work, um, uh, particularly, as, particularly as educators. Uh, my name is Rochelle Joe. I am a counselor education doctoral student. Uh, so I had a counselor's lens while we were over there and learned a great deal about the state of uh, mental health, the mental health profession in China, which is really interesting. And we went on this trip over spring break, and I felt like it was a good balance of study and break. Dr. Barber kept us on task, kept us thinking uh, as students everywhere that we went in the three cities, you know, we were reflecting on higher education, what we were learning about the culture and the people while we were there, but we were also able to just enjoy the people and the culture while we were there. So it was a great balance um, of those two, and like Leslie, I definitely think it's um, a transformative experience that all graduate students should have the opportunity to do at some point. Um, I, I, this question's for Emily. I, it struck me with your two sections that there seem to be different experiences in both of those. And in particular, you saw how in the one they watched the films together and in the other not so much. And it seemed to have a parallel with what they were getting out of it. What do you think some of the reason is for that? Um, it's really hard for me to know. It could just be things like, because in, in class I give them opportunities to ask questions about the assignments and so sometimes people will ask are we required to watch the film together and maybe in one of the classes I said no but you should and maybe in the other class nobody asked that question and so it was never addressed it could be something really simple like that where a seed was planted in one but not in the other and that does happen depending on what the students ask so for example right now with the final projects in one of the classes the students were in one of the sections one of the students asked whether the their partner needed to actually write on the blog, like if it needed to be a collaboratively written blog. And I said, that's not required. But in the other class, nobody ever asked it, and so maybe it'll turn out differently in that class. And I'm sort of allowing for that kind of difference of experience, depending on what they ask. Um, yeah. I um, had a question for Jim. You mentioned, you started right off by saying, uh, you know, working on raising the level of rigor in, in the study abroad, and, and that's something that we're, um, working on I'm at the School of Business and um, 
we run a number of study abroads and, and both consistency as well. Some professors do better at it than others, and uh, not that you want to tie anyone's hands too much, but so I'm, I'm interested in uh, whether you had advanced preparation for the trip, uh, and if so, uh, to what extent? Like, how many times did you meet? What did you cover? That kind of thing. Sure, sure. And in, um, in talking about that article that I referenced, with some of the students um, this morning, one of the students who shall remain nameless said, we don't need to focus on the rigor anymore. It's rigorous enough. <laughs> um, but, but it's something that I had in mind from the beginning. And so we did meet, um, I think it was three, three times formally as a class for a, a two and a half hour class beforehand. And so that was almost every other week. In, the, in January and February as we were leading up to spring break. Mm -hmm. And then we've met um, once already since we've been back and we'll meet um, again, I think, next week for kind of re-entry and, and reflection classes as well as um, kind of, I'm, I'm realizing now we, we also need some hands-on um, time to spend together just to talk about the technology and the format and, and kind of the the outcomes of the assignments. And so, did you cover in the three sessions before you went more content uh, or more co country preparation? Or it was a mix of both. We we had some common readings that we <coughs> looked at in terms of teaching and learning. That was really helpful to kind of give us a common foundation for conversations that we were that we were having in China. We also I should have mentioned this earlier had um, great interdisciplinary collaboration with both Chinese Studies and the Confucius Institute in those preparation classes. Emily came in and gave a guest lecture um, on one evening, and Dan Hussman from the Confucius Institute did the same, um, as well as Mike Bloom from Academic Technology. So we really, I mean, for me as an instructor, the interdisciplinarity was a, a really important part of this project as well. I was just telling Billy earlier um, as we were setting up that it's fun to to be able to see everybody because we, we've done a lot of our communication over email. So to actually all be in the same room and talk about what we're learning and what we're doing has been, has been a bonus. Hi, I'm Jin Zhu Zhang and uh, I'm a doctor student in the CAP program at the School of Education. And uh, actually, um, the reason I'm here today is I'm very interested in the projects all of you are doing because actually I'm doing a very similar project. I'm the project leader of the Virtual Conversation Partner Program at William Mary. And last year we just launched the first pilot and we had over 137 students participating including domestic students and international incoming international students. Um, so I really uh, relate to the issues and the promising, f you know, uh, features of the blogging and uh, uh, conversations on Skype. So my question I uh, is, is there a possibility we can collaborate in the future? Because um, from last year's participants, we had a lot of student, American students who, who were majoring in Chinese. And um, um, over 80% of incoming international participants, they are also Chinese. So um, they also, um, in their feedback, they also expressed their interest. They really would like to continue their partnership uh, during the school year after they arrive. But because uh, last year the project was funded by the diversity office, and this year and in the future will be funded by the Rave Center. But still, because of the budget issues, we could not provide more activities during the school year. So my question is really, you know, could we pro work together and provide more opportunities for them? Um, uh, so the language partnership we have right now is actually built and supported by the faculty of Chinese studies and we would actually love to have students who participate in the virtual conversation program to continue the experience uh, either in language exchange or culture exchange. So uh, I think there would be a great opportunity for cooperation, uh, collaborative work. Yeah. Uh, a second question. Um, this is to uh, Dr. Wilcox. Uh, I, I saw the examples of students' blog, and I noticed actually they're in English. Mm -hmm. So 
I guess the students are now required to write in Chinese. Yeah, so that's um, this class is a GER class, okay. and so it's actually open to students of all majors. And so for that reason, I can't require the students to use Chinese in the class, and I can't even use it in the class because there's students coming from Japanese studies, for example, in the program and who are majoring in completely other topics who are taking it for their one global studies GER. So this class is not a language class. But for the final blogs, um, I gave them the option of using either language if they are um, in the Chinese program, or some of the students are actually um, from China or from Taiwan. So the they'll have more flexibility for using Chinese in the final project, but that's just because this is not a language class. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Emily, I have a question for you. Um, it was great to hear sort of student perceptions about they're doing their film analysis using rich media. Uh, I'm curious to your, as your perceptions. Uh, I really enjoyed reading through the student work and I was struck by the substance and the depth of the reflection, but I'm curious to see what your perspective is on them doing in this format versus writing a paper, if you saw any differences, positive or negative, with you know incorporating more rich media? Yeah. Um, I think that the quality overall was higher than just if they had written um, like a two to three page paper, which is what the length was corresponding to. And I think it was better in the sense that they were using the, the images to supplement their ideas, but also just in general, the proofreading and the quality of the writing was better. And I think that had to do with the fact that they were making it public. Um, and it, it actually caused a challenge for me, like Jim was talking about in the assessment part of the assignment, because I found that overall the quality was very similar. There were you know, a couple of the projects that really stood out, but overall when the students presented their work, they had a very clear sense of their ideas. And then when I looked back on the blogs, it had been written very well. So one of the things that I luckily had um, incorporated into the syllabus early on because I, I was worried about this because this has happened in the past when I've had students do multimedia projects, they tend to be quite good. And so I actually have the students have um, weekly reading quizzes in class that are based on the readings that are pretty difficult because they're only 10 questions. If they get one wrong, it's down to a 90. So I use the, w the reading quizzes as a way, obviously, to encourage them to do the reading, but also to balance out the grading because the quizzes are just uh, much, it's much harder to do well on them. And that way, if the projects are very good, um, I can give higher grades and it won't overall impact the class um, as a whole. So that's what I've done so far. I don't think it's a perfect solution, but um, it is one of the challenges that from my perspective. We actually have in the modern languages department, um, because of grade inflation, like we actually have certain percentages of, we're not allowed to give more than a certain percentage of A's. And so that has been a serious challenge. Yeah. Um, but so one of the things I've tried to do is um, I keep experimenting with different rubrics. And so for the final project, one of the, the elements that the students are being graded on is creativity and their use of the platform in new ways. So hopefully that will make it more challenging for them. Actually, this is also related to the, the film class because um, a long time ago, I had the idea about um, doing, it's also to help international students on campus to really to uh, interact with American students. So is, there, uh, is it possible to create a class which you not only teach each, um, Asian or Chinese film, but also American film, but you have students coming from both um, you know, domestic and international. So you actually have this environment to have both sides of students discuss, you know, have discussions in one classroom. I don't know whether is that possible, either at the School of Art yes, or? There, I, I think there are a number already. Oh, sorry. Um, the, the film studies department here isn't really a department, so it's an interdisciplinary program that's across from a number of departments. So I teach a class a year in it, but we have a, con um, a memorandum of understanding of sorts with modern languages. So actually a number of modern languages faculty teach courses that are also film studies courses. So there's already a number of courses that are being taught that are cross-listed between different modern language departments mm -hmm. and film studies. I don't know if the one that you did was. It might count towards it, I think. But we have a lot of film students take courses in the Russian post-Soviet program, the Latin American studies, Chinese um, you know, uh, it's across the board already. So there are a number of courses there that are already. Also, um, history has a number of courses, like Hiroshi Kitamura teaches one on the nuclear world, which is a lot of Japanese film. 
um, film from Asia that looks at it. There, there are a number of those courses already that are, that are open to all students. Um, but the film studies department, if you looked on the courses that are listed there, I think you will find some opportunities. Do you know in the past courses, uh, did you have any international students participating? Um, even in my courses, which is not based on this, it's a, it's a race, class, gender sort of courses, I've always had international students in there. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 partly it depends on the GER qualification, partly it depends on if the courses are open, which does become an issue sometimes. Um, but I know definitely between Film studies would not have huge numbers of international students, but they're taught with modern languages, so often those courses do have a large mix. So you'd have that kind of element. Thank you. Um, for, for future um, trips, as professors start to plan these um, outings, I mean, trip, study abroad, uh, I went with um, Pam Eddy for the Irish trip, and I was lucky enough also to go on the China trip. Um, and by far the most important thing and the most deepening um, encounter that I had was th the opportunity to speak with people um, and engage with people from that country. In uh, Pam's class, my personal project was, because I'm a language person, to explore the decline of Irish Gaelic language from uh, people from the country, from, from, from teachers, from just people I met on the street or people I met at a pub or uh, students. And so I videotaped their comments and did a 30 minute um, film on that as for my project. Um, in Jim's class, we had the opportunity, as you saw, to uh, meet with students and professors and talk about our interests. And I talked about um, English language classes and how they learned and this kind of thing. Today, um, Jim sent to me uh, an article by Engel and Engel. You might know that they have the, um, the study abroad program in, in Provence, France, and they're very, very good about the engagement level. And they talked about different le levels of intercultural competence from, um, from just an educational tour to, ex to exposure to um, encounter to engagement and to integration, the levels. And I felt like in these two situations that I was able to get up to engagement in a very short amount of time, which was for me the absolute most important thing. And since then, I've actually continued to communicate with the students that I met in China. We're talking back and forth on email about issues and education and this kind of thing. So I would encourage uh, that to be absolutely a deliberate piece of any trip and if there was some way to continue that kind of engagement between the people there, whether it's other students or professors or maybe even a project or, um, or something that you would be able to do back and forth, I don't know how, but you know, we talked about future projects with these, with these students in China, about collaborating somehow. Um, but that was by far uh, the most deepening experience for many of us. Um, we're almost out of time, but there was one question or comment, so. I'll be quick. I was just, um, uh, it seems like the popularity of the, uh, obviously the, the international uh, world is, is uh, in, in, in discovering new cultures and, and all aspects of all different countries is growing, and especially here at William & Mary, and I was wondering, especially when Maho was talking about the difficulty of, for instance, having uh, some of the students um, reach that 400 level language. Um, has there been a lot of uh, discussion on whether or not courses may be offered in those specific languages, or has, is, what's the outlook on uh, offering opportunities to students to actually take courses, like maybe virtual courses, in those areas? Because I feel like that would not only cross over interdisciplinary in the language and whatever discipline that you're studying, but it's also interesting, it'd be neat to actually sit through those classes and you would be learning a ton about how those, especially in the world of education, how those classes run, how those courses run, how higher ed feels, what it's like, um, but it'd be a great opportunity, I feel. So if anyone needs to leave, it's, it is past our time, so feel, you should feel free, and if you want to stay, continue talking, I'm sure we would ha be happy to do that for a couple more minutes. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.